that he was only a part of this enormous machine which dealt with the persecution of Jews. This was from the very beginning, and this is how it went on. He was not the only one to set up this machinery of Nazi persecution, which brought hundreds of thousands of Jews to escape in a hurry from the Reich and from the annexed territories. With him, there were tools, and there was the wicked regime, because without them he could not have succeeded in this implementation of this plan. The rules of evil, the concentration camps, all this army of torturers advanced his activities and aided his plan. What they all did together is to create the conditions from which the Jew fled. All this administration and organization to expedite and accelerate the fleeing of people from the countries where they lived in, where their ancestors lived for ages before them, was a network of acts of crime. And we are the summary of precedents. In all my summing up, we printed whole parts of these basic rules done in a language understood by the Council for the Defense and three copies to the Court. I mark this material with my initials. Okay. <coughs> Rules about evidence will be found on the last pages of this material submitted. A basic rule in the law of evidence permits the submission of documents which were drawn up by officials, public officials, whilst fulfilling their public duty as proof to acts and events described therein. And this is one of the accepted exceptions from the doctrine of hearsay evidence. President of court, what page is this that you are quoting from, sir? I am quoting from page 42 and onwards of the legal material submitted. President of court, thank you. Such evidence is admissible on the sub-universal assumption that a public officer fulfills his duty properly and in the language of the High Court in Israel that if this is his official duty of the officer in brackets to make notes of the name check or certain things which happened in his presence this he will do in good faith faith and activity. and justifies the admittance of such hearsay evidence. As the Israeli case deals with a statutory duty, it was the duty of that officer to draw up the document. And this is what interested the court in the case. The rule in full is given in the law of evidence in uh, the fifth volume 
מבקשים להסתמך על סעיפים ‫המסקנה On the strength <laughs> of the laws of evidence, <laughs> that the statements in the document serve as proof for the authenticity of the and veracity of the contents, and the onus of proof is on the accused to persuade and convince the court that the documents lie, whereas he himself speaks the truth. The accused cannot carry this weight, and not only for the reasons to which we have already pointed. In the diagram that he prepared for his defense, he marked October 1939 as the date of his transfer to Berlin. This very same, or approximately the same day, was mentioned in the timetable which he prepared for the defense and which the defense is about to submit, and we have received a copy of it. Logic too requires that a man rigorously selected for the task of combating Jews will take part in such a decisive session. Moreover, Eichmann's entire activity in the uprooting of population as part of the activities of Department Shaw before Acts which he admits to having committed, that is to say, the accounting of Jews and Poles from the areas incorporated into the Reich and their transfer to that part of the occupied Polish area known by its designation of Government General Area, a task for which he received a special nomination was done for no other reason than to promote that plan agreed upon in that meeting. And as I have pointed out, he confessed and admitted in the cross-examination that he had directed all of this relocation work and that the experience which he gave in his work in Vienna prepared him for this duty. And he carried it out in cooperation with the institutions set up for the purpose of dispoliating the property of the deportees, an institution which with typical Nazi perversity was called Trusteeship Institute East. The horrors of these mass deportations into the government general area are familiar to us also from the Hans Frank diary, the diary of the man who was the governor general of the government general area. The relevant passage from the Frank diary I have already mentioned in my introductory address. 
May I hear only stress the horrors of the Schneider Mill deportation as determined in the report presented by a joint Jewish-Polish committee which acted in cooperation with the Red Cross and with the Quakers and the Friends Society. The deportees were not permitted even to take one single suitcase with them. Handbags, bags were taken away from women. Many men were deprived of their overcoats. They were taken to three villages, Piasko, Gruski, and Bershicha, a distance of 25 to 30 kilometers from Lublin. There they had to wait for the Shtetin deportees, that is to say, to those of them who survived. And there is where the death march commenced. Men, women and children marched on foot in temperature of 22 degrees Celsius below zero in snow-covered on snow-covered roads. Out of 1,200 people deported from Stettin, 72 remained alongside the way and most of them crying. The legal principle to which I want to point now, a principle which has far-reaching consequences with regard to the part played by the accused in the complex of crimes described in the indictment, this is the principle of conspiracy. All references which we shall bring are taken from Anglo-Saxon judgments and they pertain to grave crimes, although such crimes that were committed in uh, the nature of which were the normal criminal acts, one murder, one act of murder, one act of robbery and so on. But there is no doubt that the Legal doctrines outlined in those decisions apply just as well to crimes which embrace an entire continent and the, crime apply, the rules apply to the crime just as well or even more because it is a crime which is more horrible and more comprehensive. The law imposes criminal responsibility on the man who murders one soul and this applies just as well to the murder of millions. Following common law, our Supreme Court described a criminal conspiracy. This was in the Goldstein case, page one in our pamphlet. In the following manner, the proof was given about the conspiracy between two people or more, and in the second place, it must be proven that the aim was an act which is considered illegal. And the consequence of such a criminal, of such a conspiracy, as was set down in the judgment of the Supreme Court, that once a man entered into a conspiracy with others to perform an illegal act, then implicitly he gives his agreement to his, the fact that his accomplices would use any means needed to obtain this aim. Moreover, each and every one of the conspirators will be responsible for the acts, acts of all the other accomplices to the extent that these acts were performed for the aims of the conspiracy and for their advancement. Now on page four of the booklet which you are holding, there are quotations from this judgment, and I shall read only a few lines. It's in the third paragraph about the responsibility of a conspirator for the acts of the other conspirators. 
There is no doubt that the distinguished judge in the lower court thought that one is entitled to use evidence about the acts of one conspirator as admissible evidence against all the other conspirators. And from a substantive point of view, one can sentence the other conspirators for that act even if they did not actually take part in its commission. In other words, one conspirator is in the nature of an agent for all the others and his acts must be judged as the acts of an accomplice to the crime in the spirit of paragraph 4 of the criminal law ordinance. This is the ruling of the late Judge Goytain, whose loss is still fresh in the hearts of all of us. Justice Goytain brings a quotation from Williams in his judgment, which is in the same passage. And then on page 5 in the appendix, an American judgment, United States versus Boyd. The principle which underlies and controls cases of this character is the elementary and very familiar doctrine, applicable alike to crimes and mere civil injuries that every person must be presumed to intend and is accordingly held responsible for the probable consequences of his own acts or conduct. When therefore one enters into an agreement with others to do an unlawful act, he impliedly assents to the use of such means by his co-conspirators as are necessary, ordinary, or usual in the, in the accomplishment of an act of that character. And the consequence, the conclusion is that which was accepted in criminal appeal, the criminal appeal in the Sweetland case, and this was also used by the late Mr. Justice Goytain, it is on top of page 5, every act done by a conspirator in furtherance of a conspiracy is done on behalf of all the conspirators. For that reason, as the Goldstein and Kaiser judgments show, each accomplice to a conspiracy, each partner to a conspiracy, is an agent for the other conspirators, and his acts are of the same nature as the acts of all of his partners. This basic doctrine in the law of criminal conspiracy has in the course of time become a principle in the law of evidence and one can use evidence about the act acts of one conspirator against the acts of others for two purposes. First of all, to prove the very existence of the conspiracy and its object and secondly, to the conclusion of the criminal responsibility of each and every one of the conspirators on condition that the requirements enumerated in the doctrine are fulfilled. This doctrine, to the extent that it pertains to the law of evidence, that is to say, for the application which can be made of proof of the acts of one conspirator against all of the others, also derives from other judgments, including the Amuri judgment. It is on page two of this booklet. 
המדבר על הברית הנחרדת בין הקושרים. בלשונו של פסק הדין. And I quote from the judgment. Once this unholy alliance was concluded, and all the conspirators had agreed among themselves, they become criminal Siamese twins which are no longer separable. To put it differently, the criminal conspiracy comprises a perfect crime by itself, even when nothing is done in fact to further or carry out the criminal objective. However, once an act was committed as a result of this conspiracy, and for the furtherance of the criminal objective for which the criminal Our conspiracy was done, then each and every one of the band of accomplices will carry responsibility for this act. There is no need, in fact, for the conspirators to know each other as was determined by the Supreme Court in the Shokron case. This is on page one of the booklet. which this conspiracy was designated. In the book of Williams, there is a following quotation. The need not have met or communicated with each other for all save one may have been enrolled by a single originator or they, have be, they may have been enrolled in a chain. Grant interpreters remark the first words were the conspirators. Call Hadarush All that is needed is to prove the agreement of the conspirators, and this is, can be done by showing that they were avowed partners to a pact for carrying out the uh, greed action by coordinated uh, work. And this is a quotation from Kenny. Uh, volume 17, page 391. Sometimes the conspiracy applies to a predetermined period or for a single act. At other times the conspiracy applies to an undetermined period and for an objective which is realized by undefined and unexpected acts. From a juridical point of view, such a conspiracy too remains in force as long as the criminal objective was neither obtained, foiled, or abandoned. And each and every one of the conspirators must perforce remain a partner to the conspiracy unless positive proof was brought for his desertion of the conspiracy. I have here employed the language used by Mr. Justice Agranat in the Ferruti case. This is on page 5 of the booklet. It is the majority judgment. And I believe that the two Judges who dissented from the majority opinion did not dissent from the principle which was set down in that ruling. This is also the doctrine in England, as we see in Kenny, volume 17, uh, edition 17, page 396. In the judgment in the Peruti case, Mr. Justice Agranat says that the continuity of the criminal conspiracy will be considered as proven prima facie once the existence of the conspiracy at any point in time was proved. 
מיסודות העיקרון הוא הצטרפות העבריין מאל הקשר לרצונו. במקרה שלפנינו עשויה על כן להתעורר הבעיה. האם הישארותו של אייכמן בארצת הרשעים תחול גם על התקופה בה היה לפי טענתו חיי הממלא הרשעות. עוד אייחד את הדיבור על העובדות התקופה במעמדו בביצוע תפקידיו של אייכמן. במקרה שלפנינו עשויה על כן להתעורר הבעיה, האם הישארותו של אייכמן בארצת הרשעים תחול גם על התקופה בה היה לפי טענתו חיי הממלא הרשעים. עוד אייחד את הדיבור על העובדות התקופה במעמדו בביצוע תפקידיו של אייכמן. בשלב זה ולצורך הטיעון המשפטי בטענה בלבד, אני אעלה את הנחה היא שאני כופר בה בכל מקרה. That he was subject to military authority of which he was not free to extricate himself. He argued that he is joining the Nazi party whose radically anti-Semitic platform was known to everyone and that his adherence to the SD and his assumption of the various tasks which he אשר תוכניתה האנטישמית הקיצונית ידועה על הכל, וכן הצטרפותו לשירות ה-SD וקבלת התפקידים השונים בהם עסק מרצונו החופשי בה. כי התואר הנגדית אומר, יחד עם That the only front in which he was active was combat against the Jews. And how he did this in the first stage, I have already described in a general way. President, of course, there was something of an argument that he entered the SD by mistake. This was not yes. He argued that, but this was in the period in any event before the war began. And it was certainly not in a military formation and certainly not under some kind of compulsion or duress which did not give him room to uh, get transferred elsewhere. But he says in the time of the war, when he was in a, under military discipline, he was not in a position to uh, evade his uh, duties. We shall therefore discuss both periods separately. His activity in the oppression and expulsion of civilian population and persecution for racial and political reasons in the first period, these are crimes against humanity as described in paragraph 1 of the Law for the Punishment of Nazis and the Collaborators, 1950. And this is, in this matter, follows closely the uh, definition of the same crime in the Charter of the International Tribunal, which is appended to the London Charter of 1945, and in the Law of the Supervisory Council, number 10. It is my argument that even in that period already, the accused committed his acts with the additional objective of harming the Jewish people and exterminating it at least partially. And this is the meaning of the conspiracy and the connection of this with the detentions in Dachau and Buchenwald and the prevention of transfers from there. ביציאה ובהגירה ובהמצאת הפסוקות. 
emigration is speeded up greatly. The accused maintains that when the local authorities adopted other methods, his heart was not in it, and that from that time onwards, he was forced by orders to perform all of these acts and was bound by his oath to his leader and to the flag. It is obvious that if he remained a willing accomplice to the extermination plan, then he is responsible for the acts of his accomplices everywhere. By virtue of the law of conspiracy, this is like a person who joins a band of thieves whose objective is to perform normal and ordinary thefts, but one day the chief of the gang decides that firearms should be used and in the course of one uh, theft a guard is killed, then no one will dispute that all members of this gang who remained inside after it was decided to use firearms, and even those who have auxiliary duties such as people who prepare that all members of this gang who remained inside after it was decided to use firearms and even those who have auxiliary duties such as people who prepare timetables or are in charge of warehouses are criminally responsible as accomplices to murder. I know your honors that all the examples you and all the references that I shall quote sound very strangely. Because what example, what reference, what precedent is there for these horrible matters with, about which we have heard here? But in this legal argument, in this pleading, and in a court composed of ordinary human beings, I cannot do otherwise, I can only plead by using normal precedents which with all their horror in a regular court of law, in a regular case, are absolutely nothing at all in comparison with the acts which we are discussing here. And what about a man who joined a criminal gang and remained in it against his will? A decisive answer in this matter was given in the judgment of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg when he discussed the conspiracy for declaring aggressive war. This is in the Blue Series, Volume 1, page 226. I quote, the argument that such common planning is not permanent when there exists complete dictatorship this is a baseless argument, a plan in the implementation of which several people take part is still a plan even though it may have been carried out only by one of them. And those who carry out the plan cannot evade responsibility even though they show that they acted upon instructions from the man who conceived the plan. Hitler, Hitler could not have waged aggressive war alone. He had to draw on the cooperation of politicians, military commanders, diplomats, and businessmen. And when they, knowing his objectives, gave him this cooperation on their part, they transformed, transformed themselves into to partners in the plan which he conceived. They could not be regarded as innocent because they were used by Hitler if they knew what they were doing.
that what they were assigned to their tasks by a dictator does not exonerate them from responsibility for their acts. The relationship between a follower and a leader does not deny responsibility just as he does not deny it in the context of a despotic rule of organized crime on a local scale in a dictatorial organization which does not have international ramifications, which acts in a local sphere, as we see in the Nuremberg Judgment. This was also discussed by the President of the Supreme Court in the Menkes case. It is on page 8 of the booklet. Before I go over to my next argument, I shall reply to a possible claim or by the defense. The defense may argue that at Nuremberg the argument was not accepted, the argument about conspiracy to commit a crime against humanity. This is true indeed, because the Charter of the International Military Tribunal, as well as the law for the uh, Supervisory Council number 10, which were the legal foundation for the military tribunals, they defined specific crimes. They gave formulations legal formulations for principles, accepted and existing principles of international law, which had been, existed since, which had been in existence for a long time, but was only applied then for the first time. And they defined the conspiracy for aggressive war as a crime against humanity, whereas conspiracy to commit crimes against humanity was not defined in that way. Therefore, therefore, the ruling at Nuremberg was correct and valid, but this is not the situation in accordance with our law for the punishment of Nazis and their collaborators. When we regard this law in the entire context of the laws of the State of Israel, where there applies the principle of criminal conspiracy as part of sub substantive law, and together with paragraph 1, It is then clear that the man who conspires to commit a crime against the Jewish people or against humanity or to commit war crimes will be held responsible in accordance with the general principles. To put it differently, The London Charter set the boundaries of the definition of the crimes, and from this sphere, the International Military Tribunal should not deviate, just as later on, the other military tribunals could not have exceeded the scope of the law of the Supervisory Council number 10. And they did not have that definition. On the other hand, in our law, in the law for the punishment of the Nazis and their collaborators, 1950, one must interpret the crime and the complex of its circumstances in accordance with the other provisions of our law, in accordance with the complex of our law of evidence and our substantive law.
וכפי שבית המשפט ימצא בעמוד חמישה של החוברת בסיומו של פסק דין קייזר, אמר השופט קייזר, הערה אחרונה בשאלה הזאת, לאמיתו של דבר אין בעיקרון הסובסטנטיבי הנ"ל חידוש מהפכני does not constitute a revolutionary innovation with regard to the principle of proof which states that testimony against one of the conspirators will serve as uh, evidence against the other conspirators because the second conspirator will be uh, convicted on the basis of the uh, uh, responsibility of the first one and the final result is the same. Therefore, the lawyer judge was right in convicting each one of the appellants on counts in the indictment, even though the active complicity of each one of them in the commission of a specific offense had not been proved. President of Court, Mr. Hausner, what is this uh, right uh, collection of statements uh, quoted here? Mr. Hausner, this right uh, material is from the United States Crimes Commission which has 15 volumes uh, theoretically but they're all bound together in five volumes and they are in the library of the court. President of court, did we receive it? Mr. Hausner, I believe so. Mr. Hausner, but we are quite prepared to put our own collection at the disposal of the court. It is in the library of the Supreme Court. Mr. President of Court, oh yes, that may be, but I have not seen it here. Mr. Hausner, but this is the official edition published by the War Crimes Commission of the United Nations. As for the oath which required boundless loyalty to Adolf Hitler, Judge Musmano, in his judgment concerning the concentration camps, said the following, this is in the Green Series, Volume 5, page 1161. As for the oath which required boundless loyalty to Adolf Hitler, Judge Musmano, in his judgment concerning the concentration camps, said the following, this is in the Green Series, Volume 5, page 1161. President of Court, was this printed here? Well, perhaps you can repeat the... Uh, a page, Mr. Hausner, Green Series, Volume 5, page 1161. Each and every person who took this oath surrendered his personality, gave up the right of individual judgment and self-criticism, threw to the winds his understanding, and exposed himself to the winds of moral irresponsibility. This was the poisonous root which brought forth the tree under whose branches the horrible crimes were perpetrated. End of quote. The judgment goes on to add that this oath of loyalty by itself is an act of sacrilege and a base crime and cannot serve either as a justification or an explanation for the crimes which were perpetrated by virtue of this alleged loyalty. <coughs> To conclude this part, and in order to avoid any doubts, uh, to preclude any doubts, I would like to say at this stage that the judgment of the Military Appeals Court in the Kafir Qasem matter offer against the Chief Military Prosecutor, page 9 in all. that the judgment of the Military Appeals Court in the Kafir Qasem matter offer against the Chief Military Prosecutor, page 9 in our pamphlet, 
paragraphs no 11 and 12, this does not change the above-mentioned doctrine. The paragraphs which I mentioned discuss the problem of the criminal responsibility of two soldiers who had been present at a place where the crime had been committed by other soldiers. The military court of appeals acquitted them of having committed an offense by virtue of this presence, having believed that their presence at this place was by virtue of compliance with a legal order, and it was not true that they had any share whatsoever in the offense. Under such circumstances, the presence of these people alone at a place where a crime was committed by others does not suffice to find a criminal conspiracy or complicity in a crime. In other words, as long as soldiers act upon a legal order, one cannot maintain that they were partners in a criminal conspiracy. However, from the judgment itself it transpires there clearly that if those same soldiers had been present on that spot by virtue and upon complying with an illegal order, an order which was prima facie illegal, then they too would have been considered accomplices to the crime. Therefore, the Kafkasian judgment not only that it does not aid the accused, but rather...